Thank you so much for being here today to uh, introduce a critically important bill, uh, which is our Frontline Heroes Bill, uh, which is S7792A in the Senate uh, and Assembly Bill 8408A in the Assembly. And um, I want to uh, thank so many of my colleagues from both the Assembly and Senate for being here, as well as uh, many individuals from Labor. First of all, let me say a big thank you to Assemblyman Mike Durso, who is carrying this bill in the State Assembly. On the Senate side, I want to thank uh, Senators uh, Robert Rollison and Mario Matera for being here. Thank you. Uh, on the Assembly side, I want to thank Assembly Member uh, Joseph Angelino, uh, Robert Smolin, Assemblywoman Jody Giglio, Assemblyman Joe DiStefano, uh, Assemblyman uh, Alex Bukrasny, Assemblyman Michael Novikov, Assemblyman John Lemonades. Lemonades. I, I apologize. I should have gotten that right. <laughs> and uh, Joe Angelino, I had already mentioned. So thank you so much for joining Brian here. Marr also, please. Brian Marr. Oh, and Brian Marr as well. Assemblyman Brian Marr. I apologize. Thank you, Brian. The um, the story about this bill uh, was something that happened just by chance, you know. And as members in state government. Uh, Sometimes we come in with a particular agenda, things we would love to accomplish. And sometimes things happen by circumstance by someone that we meet. And that's very much the story of this bill. For myself, I've been a volunteer firefighter for the last 31 years. And so one of the things I've always done throughout my political career, both as a county legislator and now moving into the New York State Senate, was to try and fight for our first responders to try and fight for those who put their lives on the line and put themselves at risk, trying to protect and save others. And very much a, randomly at a transit workers union event, I happened to run into a very special person by the name of Veronica Fletcher. And Veronica told me her personal story it's a story, unfortunately, that revolves around COVID and revolves around tremendous loss. Her husband, Joseph, for whom this bill is named, was one of those frontline heroes. He was a bus maintainer working with transit. And shortly into COVID, while he was out doing his job, making sure that the transit system would continue to run, he contracted COVID and passed away. Now, at the time that I met her, we were already beyond the two-year statute of limitations to be able to file a death claim for workers' compensation benefits. In protecting our frontline workers, our police, our firefighters, our EMS personnel, those are naturals. But it made me remember and realize that when it came to COVID, there were other first responders, other frontline heroes who we asked, while the whole world was shut down, we asked to go out to work and do their jobs while we stayed home so that they would keep us safe. And in listening to Veronica's story, we saw that Joseph, was one of those frontline workers, but he wasn't alone. Not only bus maintainers, but transit operators, bus and subway operators, our grocery workers, our healthcare professionals, doctors and nurses, our construction workers that were going out there to work to make sure that things continued while all of us were staying at home in an attempt to be safe, they put their lives at risk. And so we consider them to be as much frontline hometown heroes as we do our police, as we do our firefighters, as we do our EMS personnel. And that was the impetus for this bill. Now in losing her ability to actually file a death claim, and by the time we spoke, the time to file that claim had already passed, which means that Veronica and her family we're dealing with not only the loss of a husband and a father, but we're also dealing with the loss of what would equate to two-thirds of his income 
if she had filed timely for those benefits. And that would make a tremendous difference now as a single mom trying to raise three children, one of whom we have here today, Madison. That's a tremendous loss, not only personally, but financially. And how much easier would her life have been if she only had access to the benefits that she and her husband would have been entitled to? And so that was the reason for this bill today. And to tell us a little bit more about her personal story, I want to call up Veronica Fletcher, a truly inspirational person uh, who has done a tremendous job raising three beautiful children under the most trying of circumstances, to talk a little bit about her husband, Joseph, uh, and talk a little bit about what this bill would mean in terms of uh, changing the trajectory of their lives. And I'm also going to ask Madison to come up as well to, uh, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rhodes, and thank you to all who are, assemb who are assembled. Good afternoon. My name is Veronica Fletcher, and this is my daughter, Madison, standing here with me. I am the widow of the late Joseph Trevor Fletcher, a healthy, vibrant, loving, generous, talented, kind man with no underlying health conditions, who succumbed to COVID at the age of 60. He was an MTA employee, an essential worker, and a hero who died in service to New York on April 11th, 2020. He valiantly went into the trenches with his brothers and sisters in the MTA, along with his co-laborers, other essential workers and first responders, to fight an intangible enemy called COVID that waged war on our city, state, country, and the world. Trevor sacrificed his life so that other people in New York City could continue living and saving lives because during the lockdown, transit literally kept the city moving. The first COVID death in New York State, I believe, was on March 14, 2020. Despite the grim news reports and terrifying images across the globe, my late husband, like thousands of other essential workers, was committed to answering his call of duty and went into work where he contracted COVID. Trevor went into the hospital and was intubated 18 days after that very first death. And my husband came out of the hospital 11 days after entering in a body bag. As a severe asthmatic, after contracting COVID while taking care of my beloved husband, I was terrified for my life. When I was too exhausted to keep my eyes open and concentrate on breathing, I prayed that God would keep the air in my lungs as I fell asleep. I fought to live for our children at home as Trevor relentlessly fought for and eventually lost his life in the hospital. On Easter Sunday 2020, as my children were wrapped in sheets, wearing homemade face masks, sitting five feet across from me on our sectional couch, I told them their papa went to heaven the night before. I was forced to ignore the natural, compelling motherly instinct to comfort my children. We were all afraid to touch each other from fear of more death. At one point when reality set in, my younger son began to cry out and I opened my arms to him and he said, no mama, I don't have on my PPE. Due to COVID protocols, we endured the trauma of devastating loss and sickness alone, quarantined and isolated from the world. I was never able to identify my late husband's body. I stood at the casket with a hot glue gun and I decorated his casket with flowers, hearts, ha flowers, cards, and hearts. I stood at his gravesite alone. My children were unable to attend. All that I had was my pastor on FaceTime to do a committal remotely. Our family story of tragedy and loss is not that much different from the families of thousands of essential workers who heroically maintained the infrastructure of New York State during the pandemic. When biz many businesses closed their doors and went remote, 
Essential workers across our great state answer their calls to duty to defend, to protect, and care for other New Yorkers. We celebrate and thank our heroic essential workers who survived and are healthy, as well as we support those essential workers who have hidden battle wounds, such as long COVID and PTSD. We memorialize our heroic essential workers who perished in the line of duty. Upon enactment, the Joseph Fletcher Bill will address what remains, the families of the heroic fallen. The widowed spouses and orphan, orphan children of essential workers lost more than our matriarchs, patriarchs, and spouses. We lost stability, we lost resources, and most especially, we lost unconditional love because they were our own heroes all the time. And in many cases, we did not know what benefits we were even entitled to receive. We were just trying to survive. And I know my late husband, the generosity he had in his heart and the dedication he had to this city to do his duty. If I stood in front of the door and said, do not leave this house, honey, because you will die, he would have went out of the house through the basement because he was, his work ethic was unparalleled. He was dedicated and he was a sacrificing human being like all of our heroic essential workers. Times Square is often referred to as the crossroads of, crossroads of the world. Nearly four years ago, due to the lockdown and quarantine, Times Square lie empty as a barren wasteland for months as the pandemic ravaged our beloved state of New York, with Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, Staten Island, and the Bronx being the epicenter of COVID fatalities in our country. With the Joseph Fletcher Act for essential workers, along with baby bonds and scholarships for children who lost parents and caregivers to COVID. New York will also be the epicenter of hope and healing for our great state and inspire similar programs throughout the country and our world. I stand before you today as a widow of an essential worker. I stand before you today as a high school teacher with certifications in building and district leadership, retired due to disability. I stand before you as a solo parent raising three grieving children. And because in 1982, my own mother, Deborah Elizabeth Davis, died from an asthma attack in a Brooklyn hospital, I also stand before you as a motherless child, orphaned at the age of nine. And it is with that voice that I can personally attest to the lifelong challenges of living with the loss of a parent. The need for government funding allocated would be an investment in our children's future, and then more importantly, it would be a beacon of hope for nearly 15,000 children in our state. Sorry. It would be a beacon of hope for nearly 15,000 children in our state, which will empire, inspire federal funding for hundreds of thousands grieving children throughout our country. As we approach an endemic stage and the world embraces a new normal, let us remember the losses of the children and the families who are sacrificing the most with essential workers' loss and give us a hope for a future. Today, as we introduce the Joseph Fletcher Act, we thank and implore our elected government officials to continue to respond to the loss, devastation, and continued suffering of grieving families with hope for our future. Thank you, Senator Rhodes and all who assembled for this bill and the tremendous honor of naming it after my late husband, a man who was on his own working from the age of 13 and had an unparalleled work ethic. Joseph Fletcher came to this country from Grenada to live the American dream. Joseph Fletcher sacrificed his life in New York City to help others to continue their American dreams. And with the enactment of the Joseph Fletcher Act, his legacy of love and sacrifice will both honor every other essential worker who paid the ultimate price for his or her life and take care of those who remain. What I miss about Papa is how he helped us, like with school and work and other, in other ways that we needed. I feel like the bill would help us help a lot of people. Wait, what? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the 
They get to help a lot of people and opportunities they didn't know about. My papa's death made me think that I would struggle with money and, and, and solo income. The accident, my uh, household since my mother's car accident forced us to retire. The bill would allow other people who weren't able to get or didn't know about the ability to claim money, which would, which could help a lot of people pay for bills and buy stuff they needed. Some things that parents don't understand is that their kids lose a parent. And parents and adults think that they would forget about, forget about it because they are young and they barely knew them. They would, and they would make new memories. But while kids. While well, kids is growing up, their ability. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You're doing a great job. You're good. It's beautiful. You're good. It's okay. Good. Something that happens that reminds them to be their parents also lost, which can bring back things that they feel when their parents are di when their parents died. Great job. Great job. Great job. Great job. And you just heard what this bill is about in better words than any of us could ever speak. This is about protecting our frontline heroes that risked everything and giving the families that survive a second chance to be able to file a claim for the benefits that they should have received at the time, were it not so difficult uh, to be able to find out how to process a claim. Were we not in the middle of a pandemic where it was impossible to pick up the phone and call someone? Where it was difficult to get the information that they needed to find out the process to be able to do that? And in speaking with Veronica, this was a problem that was far beyond just Veronica, we realized. And that's why the bill was necessary. It turns out that there were over 6,600 essential workers who lost their lives as a result of the pandemic, as a result of exposing themselves. That's 6,600 families that would have been eligible to receive these benefits that did not, the vast majority did not, for a variety of reasons. In fact, out of that 6,600, we see that only, only 157 claims out of 6,600 were actually filed. And to go into a little more detail about those statistics, about some of the uh, reasons why uh, individuals were unable to access those benefits, we have Zoe Laskaris, who is an assistant professor at the Barry Commoner Center at Queens College CUNY. And I'm going to ask Zoe to come up and share a few words. Zoe. Thank you, Senator Rhodes, um, and thank you, Mrs. Fletcher. That was heartbreaking. Um, so I guess we're going to have to shift gears now a little to talk more about the numbers. Um, so that's my job. So good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. I was asked as an academic and occupational epidemiologist whether there is evidence in support of this bill being sponsored by Senator Rhodes. Based on my analysis, this is what I found. During the first two years of the COVID-19 pandemic in New York State alone, the CDC recorded 6,657 COVID-19 fatalities among working age adults. So this is 18 to 64 years of age. I estimate that 15% or 1,000 of those deaths were caused by an exposure to the SARS-CoV-2 virus on the job and in the course of employment the key criteria for establishing a workers' comp claim. Experts agree that the actual number of occupational COVID-19 fatalities may be twice as high. Among those 1,000 occupational COVID-19 deaths in New York State during 2020 and 2021, only 157, or 16%, received death benefits from workers' comp. This equates to one out of every six workers Let's take a moment to recognize how low that number is. Imagine six workers before us that died from COVID-19 that they contracted on the job. They will be mostly essential frontline workers, a nurse, 
a bus driver, an EMT, a meat packer, a correction officer, a warehouse worker. Only one of them will have received workers' comp death benefits in acknowledgement of their death. The other five will have stories similar to that of Mrs. Fletcher's. And we know this because this isn't a new problem with access to benefits, it is an unaddressed problem. There is a long history of well-established barriers to accessing benefits for traumatic occupational fatalities, the kind where workers go to work in the morning and don't come home at the end of the day, and especially for occupational illnesses, some of which take years, decades to develop. Three of the most important barriers to accessing benefits are these. Lack of knowledge surrounding eligibility, difficulty demonstrating the work-relatedness of an illness, and challenges maneuvering a complex legal system. For the first barrier, families simply didn't know that they could apply. And without a substantive outreach campaign, how would they? By contrast, outreach for the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund and the World Trade Center Health Fund are ongoing over 20 years since the attacks. For an infectious disease, families face an additional barrier. They weren't 100% sure where the deceased contracted COVID, and this lack of confidence will deter someone from applying or pursuing a legal claim. Those families didn't get the message that working in a COVID prevalent environment is their evidence. COVID prevalent means one that is public facing, indoors and in a poorly ventilated environment, in close proximity to others or among patients with known or suspected COVID. These criteria are highly predictive of a worker's COVID-19 exposure risk. There is at least one more obstacle to overcome. The New York State Workers' Comp Claim Filing System is not user-friendly. In an analysis of COVID-19 claims from 2020 and 2021, we found that claims with legal representation were five times as likely to be awarded benefits than claims without. Unfortunately, we see the same trend when claims for all types of injuries and illnesses are considered. Claims get lost in the system. In conclusion, there is substantial evidence there's a substantial amount of evidence to justify extending and reopening workers' comp claims for a sizable number of work-related COVID-19 deaths among frontline workers that have been, as of January 1st, 2024, time barred from applying for benefits. But this is the first, an important first, of many necessary steps that we have to take if we actually want to see people apply and we actually want to get benefits into their hands. Thank you very much. Great job. And uh, this bill would, in some small way, uh, attempt to address that by reopening the period of time for uh, impacted families to be able to file a death claim through workers' compensation by extending that period for one year. And to speak a little more about the, uh, the labor, health, and safety perspective on this particular legislation and the overall problem, I want to call up Char uh, Charlene Obernacher, uh, who is the executive director of NICOSH. So Char Charlene. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I had a bunch of notes that I was going to read, and then after hearing from you, Mrs. Fletcher, I just felt that really the human aspect of this legislation needs to be talked about. At NICOSH, we do education and training. We train about 10,000 to 15,000 workers every year. And the number of workers who don't themselves know about what benefits they can receive is tremendous. Not only do they struggle to realize that they could access workers' compensation, but the, the deadlines and the timeliness of those deadlines are very confusing for the average person, uh, for anyone really, to, um, to move forward with. And I want to just speak for one second about the workers that we're talking about, right? As Zoe alluded to, these are first responders, but they're essential workers in all types of industries. These are nurses, these are doctors, these are police officers, these are firefighters, these are school teachers. These are folks who you might not think about as um, the first person to come to mind when you think of a first responder, like a construction worker, for example. And 
we all remember where we were when we first realized we weren't going to go to the office in March of 2020, right? If you were a professional worker, you know where you were, you would probably remember that first week, right, of staying home, of, of not going in. I remember it myself. A lot of people don't have those memories. Instead of remembering waking up, making their coffee at home, making their own breakfast, and sitting down in front of their laptops, they remember the hellscape that was New York in March of 2020. And this bill is about those essential workers. This bill is about the Fletcher family, and it's about so many others like the Fletcher family who were not able to file. I think that the data that we've reviewed this morning or this afternoon is so important because it really showcases the depths of this problem. And imagine what we could do with outreach. Imagine how many other families could be impacted if we just did outreach, if we just told people about this extension bill if it were to go through. This would be tremendous. So again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I'm very grateful to you, Senator Rhodes, for introducing this, and well, to you, you Senator Thank you. And uh, the Senate is only one half of the legislature. We needed a, a colleague, a partner uh, on the, in the other house uh, who is a tremendous friend, a tremendous leader, uh, and also someone who uh, shares uh, our affinity for, uh, for labor, um, and also a valued member of the Labor Committee in the State Assembly and the sponsor of this legislation in the Assembly, Michael Durso. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, thank you, Senator Rhodes, for your leadership on this. Um, it's my honor to carry it in the assembly. Uh, thank you to the Fletcher family for being here. Uh, our heart is with you. Um, and it, again, it is our honor, our, all of our honor, to be on this bill and to support it, to do what we can for your family. Um, and really, my comments are going to be brief. This is very simple. It's very basic. This bill is to right a wrong, right? We asked our frontline workers, our police, our fire, our essential workers, everybody down from transit to our supermarket workers, to sanitation workers, which I was one of those during this time. I also acted as a first responder at night. We asked these people every single day. Actually, the state demanded that these people go to work, keep our economy running, our state running. We demanded that of them. We should demand of them to make this right. These families deserve what they put in for, these families deserve this compensation. These families deserve, deserve to be made whole. Um, as said before, I had notes also. And then listening to Mrs. Fletcher speak about this, um, it really hits home, and especially with their daughter here. I, too, have two young daughters. And I can't imagine uh, having to, someone having to go home and tell my family that I'm not going to make it home. Because again, we demanded that these essential workers go to work every day so that we can all live. They didn't get to Zoom to work. They didn't get to stay home and work. They had to physically go to work, like so many others. And as you heard in the numbers, one in six, only one in six received those compensation benefits. If we really look at those numbers as a state, it's almost embarrassing. Again, these are the people that we asked every day to keep our state running. And the least that we could do is take care of them and their families going forward. So once again, I thank Senator Rhodes for your leadership on this. I thank the Fletcher family for allowing us to carry this in your husband's name and in his honor. It is our honor to do so. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Senator Rhodes for any questions. Thank you, everyone. And I just want to, uh, to recognize some other leaders that we have here today, uh, some who are standing behind us, some who are here in the room uh, showing their support. Uh, we have uh, Kevin Mullick. Uh, who is the first vice president at the Nassau County Police Benevolent Association. Thank you, Kevin, for being here. Uh, Chris Wolf from the Suffolk County PBA. Uh, we have Robert Smolin, uh, Jeffrey Gross, and Michael Amira from the Police Conference of New York. Uh, Chris Kelly from the Nassau County PBA Detectives, uh, their first vice president. So, Chris, thank you very much for being here. Um, in addition, I just want to, uh, to mention... Well, Assemblyman Matt Slater. Oh, Assemblyman Matt Slater is here as well. There you are, Matt. Uh, I also wanted to, uh, to thank uh, Robert Gray, who is the, uh, the Brooklyn Regional Director of the Injured Workers Bar Association, uh, as well as the former chair of the New York Workers' Compensation Alliance for being here with us today. 
So you've heard what this bill is about. You've heard what it does. And Michael said it best. It's about righting a wrong. Individuals who put their lives on the line to keep us safe and making the families who are left behind, like the family of Joseph Fletcher, making them whole. Giving them the chance to access the benefits that they were entitled to if they had only known about them. That's fairness for our frontline heroes.